Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to this evening's uh, first lecture, ser lecture of our series for the year 19, or excuse me, 2022. Uh, we're doing something a little bit different this evening. We'll be uh, broadcasting two streams. One uh, will carry the speaker, which you're probably seeing now. The other will carry the uh, on-screen images that are being shown on uh, a standard slide projector. So this is a, uh, a new venture for us. Um, I'd like to make one brief announcement that following the program, uh, for those uh, members who are here, we'll have a brief uh, business meeting and election of, all of directors. Uh, so any of you that are interested in that, please hang on afterwards. And uh, so with that, I'd like to bring up uh, one of our directors, Mr. John Buffett. And uh, he'll introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Good evening. This is the regularly scheduled March meeting of the Historical Society of Frankfurt, which I like to uh, make sure I put into the beginning of our programs because uh, we, we've in addition to what Bruce just said, uh, we've changed up a little bit in that we are now producing these programs as a permanent record of Frankfurt history, as was done in the early years of the uh, society up until the, the Depression when they ran out of money to do it, to publish the, uh, they, they did, Early in the early years of the society, they published um, from 1905 until the Depression, they, they published uh, hard copies of, of the talks that were given, as well as publishing them first in the uh, Frankfurt Gazette. We now are going to resume that tradition, except we're doing it by recording these, uh, these things on these programs on YouTube and uh, you know, Facebook, and we're going to leave them up forever. We're not going to charge entrance fees. We're not going to require people to be members because our purpose here is to promote and preserve the history of Frankfurt and neighboring communities. And we've been doing pretty well about promoting all these years with our programs, now we're going to preserve, we're going to get back to the tradition of preserving what is said in our programs by uh, having Facebook and YouTube keep them up forever. Now, for that reason, I like to make sure that I, I give the uh, caption at the beginning, because it's the March meeting of the Historical Society of Frankfurt, so that it can be recited or cited in future references. The people in this room obviously know what the date is and why they're here. But, uh, for people who come to this in the future, I want them to be able to cite this just as though they would with um, a published uh, a written piece. So with that said, tonight's program has to do with another piece of the transportation history of this area and the United States generally. Uh, Eric Fleischer, who is the president of the John Fitch, Museum, John Fitch Steamboat Museum and also the Craven Hall Museum, is going to talk about a uh, an experiment that went on for a couple of years, a year or two, I guess, uh, in the 1790s, well before Robert Fulton, in transportation by river, by steamboat, to compete with stagecoach transportation between Philadelphia and Trenton. And it went right by the Frankfurt Dock. 
So I don't know that it necessarily stopped, the steamboat necessarily stopped at the Frankfurt dock. I'd love to prove it. We're going to be doing some more research on that. But where we are right now is we know that it went right by us in 1791 or thereabouts. And uh, that's why I thought it would be a really interesting uh, thing to, uh, to talk about. Uh, we're going to, uh, to do a sign-up sheet tonight for visiting the, the Craven Hall and John Fitch Museums, which are next door to each other, um, at some point in the future, although I think we may want to wait until we've gotten a little bit further out of the pandemic. Uh, but we will be doing that at some point, and uh, anybody who uh, is here tonight that wants to sign up for that, there's a sheet at the back. And those, anybody who's out there beyond the Delaware or, or Franker Creek, or for that matter, any of the local people who are just watching locally, we'd love to have you get in touch with us and, and uh, sign up. Give us your contact information so we can um, get in touch with you when, you're, when we're ready to do that field trip. I think it's going to wait a while until we're pretty sure that we're not going to get anybody, make anybody sick by uh, getting too close to each other. Uh, with that, um, Mr. Fleischer is going to uh, enlighten us about the, the history of uh, uh, the John Fitch uh, Enterprise and perhaps about Craven Hall as well. And uh, we welcome him. Good evening. Good evening. Would you like to have a Yes, sir, please. Yeah, don't, don't, don't trip over the mark. Oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here with Franklin. Frankfurt, excuse me, not Franklin. Frank Frankfurt Historic Society. It's a unique uh, organization. I did not know you existed until somebody contacted me, but it's, uh, it's wonderful that we have different groups, particularly in the Philadelphia area, that uh, preserve the history. I'm a Germantown boy and went to Germantown Academy, the original one, which was, uh, many people don't realize it, was the capital of the United States for a two-week period during the Yellow fever epidemic. I think it was 1793. So I kind of grew up with history at the old place. This is not the one that's in Fort Washington. This is the one that was in. So anyway, I'm delighted to be here and to talk to you about John Fitch. We all know that John Fitch was a steamboat inventor and uh, he's born in, in Connecticut. Uh, we like to call him the Rodney Dangerfield time of his time because the poor man never got any respect. And uh, I start with this first slide, which is a picture of the stone that supposedly marks his birthplace. However, it isn't on his, on his property, property where they weren't it's born. It's next door because the Navy didn't want him on their property. So it's kind of fitting that. Okay. that Okay. That begins the that story. Begins the story. <laughs> we have we uh, have a marker. Marker. Uh, uh, it is now is now uh, not here. Not here. Uh, it's not here. It's not here. Uh, we had it. Had it moved around around Johnson Warren's several times. It's been on Craven Hall property before, back in the 1970s. It was then moved to the what is a basically a center of Warminster, which is uh, Street Road and York Road. Uh, then we, we had it moved back a few years ago, along with the uh, state sign. And it now sits on our front lawn, and I hopefully it will stay there forever. But it was, uh, was purchased and installed by uh, Mr. Longstreth, who was the superintendent of the uh, railroad company here in Philadelphia, I'm trying to think the name of the uh, big locomotive manufacturer. Baldwin? Baldwin. There we go. Uh, he was the superintendent of the Baldwin Works, and uh, he 
had the stone uh, produced in 1902, and for many years it sat on the intersection of York and Street Road in Normandy. But we now have uh, had it moved, and it now belongs, hopefully, for a permanent time on our historic society. Along with it is the state sign, which, as a lot of state sign, is not always completely accurate. Uh, all we can determine is he had three mechanically successful steamboats, not four. So, uh, typical of history, not everything is exact all the time. Most people realize that Robert Fulton is the one that gets the credit for the steamboat. And actually, Fitch was 17 years earlier with the first commercial steamboat in the world, not just in the United States, but in the world, in 1790, carried passengers and freight from the Park Street Wharf in Philadelphia, dropping at Burlington and Bristol, I'm sorry, Bristol, then Burlington, and then Trenton. Uh, we don't know how many trips he made. They estimate that he traveled anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 miles back and forth one season lost money on every trip, and of course, investors uh, abandoned him, and uh, that was the end of the uh, commercial venture. Fulton, of course, picks up in 1807 on the Hudson River, and uh, the next thing we know in the next few years, steamboat service all over the United States, and again, beginning in the world, uh, became very, very common. This was Fulton's first successful steamboat. Uh, he really didn't have a name. Uh, his estate up in New York was, was the Claremont, and history says the boat was called the Claremont, but his name for the boat was Steamboat. <laughs> Again, history isn't always quite accurate. Anyway, just an overview on John Fitch. Born in 1743, he Connecticut, uh, self-taught. He had about two, maybe three years of elementary school uh, learning back in the course in those days. Uh, the only time he went to school was when there wasn't farm work to do, you know, either planting or harvesting. Uh, so he, again, like many people in this era, self-educated. Obviously a very brilliant young man from, from birth. He apprenticed with two clockmakers who quickly realized his uh, ability and said, we don't want to teach this kid too much. He'll take our business. And so what he learned, he learned uh, by sneaking in and out uh, of the clock shop. But he learned enough to be a, a clockmaker, a brass maker, a silversmith. This was the period from 1764 to 1775. Uh, during the Revolutionary War, uh, he was a lieutenant in the New Jersey militia, but actually all he did was develop uh, guns for the troops and also uh, fashioned a way that the troops could put a, a bayonet on a farmer's money. That, that was his big contribution to the uh, to George Washington and his crew. Walking from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, out west. Think about if you had to take a trip with your feet today to walk across Pennsylvania. Well, the first big and this man never had any money, and in his uh, journal, he recalls at one point when he needed to go west, he had to wait till the Susquehanna was frozen, because he didn't have enough ferry fare to, <laughs> to make it across. Um, they said that he could do 40 miles through the forests and woods. 40 miles even on a straight track would be pretty tough, but 
uh, you know, apparently quite a walk. Uh, his trips, one of his trips, uh, he did make a map of the area um, that was better, supposedly, than the max map that were available at the time. Make his own invention uh, commercially successful. 1785 to 1797, he played around with steamboat. He had a prepared, or I'm sorry, a commercial steamboat on the river for at least one year, spring, summer, and fall. Uh, 1790, carried passengers and freight, Philadelphia, all the way to Trenton, which stops at Bristol, Burlington, uh, and then of course uh, Trenton. There isn't much uh, written about those trips, which is unfortunate. There may be, but we've not been able to find any. He dies in 1798. Uh, there's a gentleman alive. And hardships. Interestingly enough, he dies in the town of Barstown, Kentucky. Anybody know what Barstown, Kentucky is famous for? Bourbon? The bourbon capital of the United States. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of fitting, although he was a rum drinker, not a bourbon drinker. Mm -hmm. Anyway. He was a founder. He, he learned to make the buttons. Smith and an arms maker during the uh, This is just a picture from an old uh, hand book. Shows him looking on the, uh, the two clock makers that he was apprenticed to. He looked, let them look at, or let him look at their uh, work. So he had to kind of sneak in to see what was going on. And then he got chastised and he was caught in the shop when he wasn't supposed to be there. This is all part of his uh, autobiography. I just took this slide down in uh, Williamsburg. Um, the founder and his son, you know, make buttons and I don't know what they were making that day, but I just snapped a picture. And there's the clockmaker, the watchmaker, flying his trade. Fitch was quite an uh, excellent silversmith, and uh, there are a few copies of his work. Um, the Washington Crossing Historical Society in New Jersey, their museum in New Jersey, not the one in, uh, in Pennsylvania, has some examples of uh, Fitch's work, if anybody is interested. This is probably the, the nicest piece that he had. This one belongs to the, uh, what used to be the Atwater Kent Museum in Philadelphia, and I think it's now the Pennsylvania Historical Society Museum. Unfortunately, it's not on display, and I couldn't even get a, a look at it to get a picture. Uh, but this was from an old book, and it was an example of uh, the quality of his craftsmanship. Uh, he was considered as good a silversmith as Paul Revere. So during the revolution, um, we moved to Bucks County. Provisioner, Sutton. Then he goes and starts a new surveying work. One of those trips is cap captured by the Indians. And uh, this becomes significant when we look at one of Fitch's first boats. Uh, 
which you'll see here in a minute. Uh, he was in captivity for almost two years. Uh, finally, the Indians turned him over to the British, and he finally escapes from the British. It says released, but he actually escaped. And uh, then he went on to do some land survey work. I said he walked from basically Bucks County, which was three times in his life, out to Ohio and Kentucky. So, now, the survey work that was done in those days was very simple. You had a transom, and you had a bunch of chains, and you had your book. And you walked through the forest with your transom, and you laid out your chain, and you marked your, your uh, position. Uh, there's a kind of a poor picture of the typical transom of the era. And uh, then he made his maps. His maps were made on a cider press back in Bucks County. And this is a page from one of his uh, trips. Beginning at the white oak, to that um, you know, so far to the cherry tree over the fallen timber. This is the way they recorded the, uh, the surveys that they did. And I asked a question in Williamsburg, uh, well, this stuff wouldn't be any good today, right? And they said, oh, no, it would be. Because the stumps of the trees, you know, would probably still be there. And you could possibly, you know, uh, redo the, uh, the steps that, that, that they showed. This is his map that he made of the Great Lakes. Uh, and apparently it was much better than what was existing at the time. And you can, you can basically see he wasn't too far off. Now the story of the steamboat begins in Bucks County, actually Warminster, Pennsylvania. And he's walking home from what today is the Neshaminy Warwick Presbyterian Church. At that time, it was called the Shamany Manor. He's walking home from, from the church from a, probably a sermon to a uh, home where he boarded. He never owned a house. It was about four miles from the church, and he's walking with his friend, James Ogilvy. And in these days before patents, when you wanted to get an idea documented, you had a a person affidavit what she told him. And this is the affidavit that John Fitch gave to his walking partner, John Ogilvy, James Ogilvy. I do certify that as I was returning with John Fitch from the Shannon meeting sometime in April 75, 1785, sorry, the guards, as near as I can recall, when a gentleman and his wife passed us by in a riding chair, he immediately grew inattentive to what I said. Some time after, he informed me that at that instant, the first idea of the steam truck or boat, and actually his first idea was a steam carriage, which he gave up pretty quickly because the roads were so bad, he realized that nothing would hold together. So we quickly uh, moved to a, a steam boat. This typical carriage, that's the best picture I could find to uh, relate to. He then begins making models, which he sails on a little pond in, in uh, Davisville, which is part of the, uh, the Warminster Southampton area. The pond is still there. It's changed its con uh, configuration quite, not, uh, quite a lot over the years. This is the only model that remains of what he worked with at that pond. And he gave this to Ben Franklin, who was president of the uh, Historical Society. And uh, that model still exists at the, uh, at the museum. And yet for, for a whole number of years, it sat in a cabinet and was listed.
never worked. He went on to try a number of different things, and the one that finally works is the one in, with the paddles in the rear. Uh, this is the home where he his support three different times and then just looked at this badly dressed you know individual and just tried to get him go away you're bothering me and, and Fitz tells the story that the last time he sees Ben Ben pulls out a dollar bill out of his desk drawer imagine when a dollar was worth in 17 17 and he hands it to Fitch to go away. And Fitch tells the story that he threw the dollar bill on the ground and walked away and never saw Ben Franklin again. He probably could have eaten for a couple of months on that dollar, but uh, his pride was too great for him to, uh, to accept money from Ben. And one of the reasons that Ben was not interested in, in Fitch's idea, he was promoting idea by a man by the name of Rumsey in Virginia who had the essence of what became uh, propulsion from the rear of the boat by pumping water and out the rear and you know moving the boat forward. Uh, of course the pumps in those days you know wouldn't provide any real uh, pressure to do that but the, the concept was Anybody recognize this guy? He's Patrick Henry. And he was the governor of Virginia at the time that Fitch was trying to get support for his steamboat. And Patrick Henry was interested because back in colonial days, if you remember, Virginia went all the way to the West Coast. And of course, the Mississippi River was in there. And Patrick Henry could envision that, hey, a steamboat on the Mississippi, yeah, we could make some money there. But he was never able to raise enough funds. With, uh, he made a, a map, and they took, this is a, a slip that you, if you bought his map for so many crowns, French crowns, I'm not even sure what their, what their value is at that time. But, uh, uh, and Patrick Henry, Patrick Henry supported it, hoping that they would get enough money to Fitch to be successful, but it never happened. Anybody recognize Mr. Madison? Always have fun with this. Who was the first president of the United States? Not this guy. First president of the Continental Congress. So, you know, in some ways, the first president of the United States. Uh, he thought Fitch's idea was great, but the government had no money. And, uh, so they couldn't support it. He went to see George down in Mount Vernon. Uh, George is, uh, he's just a retired politician now. He's just a farmer from Mount Vernon. But George is supporting a man by the name of Rumsey who has a boat that works against the current with poles as long as the river bottom is not too deep. And you, you move the boat up head with a paddle, and then you use oars that stuck into the, the uh, stream bed to keep from backing up. Of course, it had, you know, very limited uh, utilization. But uh, George was involved in this because he was interested in the canal system in the United States, and so he rebuffed Fitch. Uh, this without going into detail, this was his uh, statement for Mr. Rumsey supporting him, and this is what Fitch was after. He, he was looking for a written piece from George Washington, the founder of the country, uh, to support his steamboat, but it never happened. This is Mr. Rumsey's picture. Yes, we know. So the idea of steam carriage, steamboat, begins in 1785 
He built a model of steam engine. His first steamboat trial is on the Delaware River. And it's at the time of the Constitutional Convention. So he takes some of the members of that convention on a trip on his steamboat down the Delaware up to Schuylkill and back. And uh, figures, you know, I'll get some support here. And I guess they just, it was just way too far ahead of its time. Because they thought, oh, this is interesting, but, you know, this will never work commercially. So, unfortunately, it, it died. But in three years, he had a commercial steamboat operation on the Delaware. They estimate that, that he traveled for a whole season, approximately 2,500 to 3,000 miles, between the Art Street Ferry and Trenton, New Jersey, uh, carrying freight and passengers. Lost money on every trip, but because uh, he cut the price below stagecoaches and sailboats in order to get passengers and freight. And of course, you know, if you're going to invest in somebody and you keep, they keep losing money, how long are you going to continue? And so it only lasted for one season. He tried, there was a French envoy here uh, in Philadelphia who said, Come on to France. I'll get you a patent and we'll, uh, you know, we'll get your steamboat going over there. And it might have happened if it weren't for the guillotine, because it was a long time of, uh, of history. And they were taking heads at the time, and nobody was really interested in sticking their neck out, so to speak, for a steamboat. He finally gives up in Pennsylvania. He goes to Kentucky. And that's where he dies in Barstown. I think I already mentioned that he was a heavy drinker, and it, it's appropriate that he should die in the capital, the bourbon capital of the United States. This was his first a sketch of his first commercial steamboat. And if you remember, I talked about him being captured on one of his trips by the Indians. You've all seen the pictures of the Indian war canoes paddling from both sides. This is how he got his idea for the first propulsion mechanism for his first steamboat. This is just as many sketches from, uh, we are fortunate to have an autobiography by Pitch, which he turned, to, he turned into the uh, library, Philadelphia uh, library. And uh, so you can get a lot of uh, detail and there's a lot of sketches that he had. He also was a, was a uh, clock maker and a goldsmith. This is an ad from 1791 in Philadelphia. Uh, he's informing the public that he's open for business. But his real desire, of course, was, was for steamboat. And finally, in, in 1790, he raises enough money from other merchants to build a 60-foot boat. This is a replica of uh, an idea of what it probably looked like back then. The paddle mechanism was in the back. And he had ads in the uh, Philadelphia Gazette. The name was the Steamboat. Very simple. Ready to take passengers. Leaving from the Park Street Ferry in Philadelphia. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to Burlington, Bristol, Morgantown, and Trenton, returning on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays, and then the price is listed in the ads. There are about 23 ads in the Philadelphia Gazette that were almost exactly the same, so he just took one. But that's how he tried to promote his, uh, his venture. In 1790, when they opened the patent office, he figured, well, at least I'm going to go get a patent. And he shows up on the first day, and four other people show up saying, we were first. We had a steamboat also. And uh, Mr. Fitt, Mr. Jefferson, who at that time was the Secretary of State uh, and the head of the Patent Office, and I think George Washington was involved, they put their heads together and they said, we have no way of figuring out who was first, so we'll just give the same patent to the poor guys on the same day and let history figure it out. And of course, uh, Pitch went ballistic and 
uh, he wrote a, a scathing letter to Jefferson, who was the Secretary of State. It was never published uh, because his friend said, you don't want to do that. You may need this man someday. But they were never good friends after that, if they ever were. Uh, I throw this in because he's a you know, typical inventor. He's always thinking. He's on a trip from, from England after he had gone to France to see if he could get the French to, to support his steam boat. And that didn't work. And he's working his way back from England. Uh, and he's looking at the way they navigate. And he said, oh, this is ridiculous. So he comes up with what they call the ready reckoner, which was a process that made it much, much easier for a seaman to figure out where he was in the ocean. The problem with this was the captains of these boats, when they saw this, said, hey, wait a minute. We don't want our seamen to see this. They could take over the boat if they know how to navigate, because this was one of the ways that captains you know, secured their ability not to lose their vessel to the crew because they knew more about navigation than, uh, than the crew did. So how much it ever actually got used, we don't know. But uh, it's called the Ready Reckoner. This is a model that sits in the uh, Columbus <laughs> Historic Society, oh, uh, actually the Ohio Historic Society in Columbus, uh, Ohio has no paperwork, but it was found in the attic of his daughter's house when she died. And it's just assumed that it was a model that Pitch had. I don't have any proof, but you know, it kind of makes sense. What's a model doing in his daughter's you know, attic? Uh, it sits on flanged, flanged wheels, and that's the first model in, in the history of the world that would have flanged wheels. So this thing was going to run on a track. Uh, they think he might have been experimenting with the first railroad engine, what would have been the first railroad engine. But because there's no paperwork, uh, they don't know. There was a lot of controversy back in the early days of steamboating that uh, people that had steamboats had exclusive use of certain rivers and, and uh, ponds to run their steamboats. And it became a real problem, particularly on the Hudson. Uh, so the government finally just said, we have to, we have to make the rivers and, and uh, lakes of the United States open for transportation for everybody. And uh, Daniel Webster, famous uh, lawyer, was involved in that process. But it all starts with the invention of the steamboat. Uh, same gentleman. This again, I think this is the last slide I had here. Just a, this is the extract of a letter. Tells the story of when the first idea came about, April 15, 1788. James Scout, by the way, is buried in our graveyard at Craven Hall, so we have a direct connection to people that were with Pitch. Pitch, of course, is definitely buried in Bardstown. Uh, another uh, gentleman that was with Pitch at that time, also buried in our uh, graveyard, Abraham Sutton. And then we have a direct connection to Pitch from this document. Uh, halfway down the page here, you may not be able to read it clearly, but the name Harmon Van Zandt, he's actually was the owner of what today is Craven Hall. And this is an affidavit for Fish saying that these gentlemen all saw his uh, models when he sailed them and encouraged him to continue on with his experiments. So that's our direct connection to John Fish. And just another. And I took my trip down to Barstown to see just exactly what was there to, to uh, 
commemorate this gentleman. And it's a very nice monument in the, in the town square uh, dedicated to John Fitch and Benjamin Day. He is recognized in the congressional record in, in uh, 1927 uh, to clarify who, who actually invented the steamboat. And just like today, you'll hear people say, well, Robert Fulton. But no, he's, he's now recognized as of 1927 as the true inventor of the world's first commercial steamboat. This model used to sit down there by the, uh, I don't think it finally fell apart to be included. And then, to me, this, this statement from, from Fitch says it all. You think this is 240 years ago. Did they think he was crazy? No. No. He was kind of nuts. Went across the ocean with steam. Give me a break. You realize that today we still cross the ocean with steam? <laughs> they operate steam turbines on our big commercial vessels. Anyway, that's. Mr. Mr. Fitch's story, and we stand on it. Thank you. Don't don't run away. Oh, don't run away. Don't run away, run away yet. <laughs> okay. Let's see if we have any questions. Any questions from the uh, audience present? No. Uh, I had a couple. Uh, are we going to hear from Vanessa? Vanessa, are you there? I don't know. Where are we going to hear from some of the remote viewers? You you mentioned two clock makers. Yes, he was he was apprenticed to two clock makers. We know a little bit about clock makers, Philadelphia clock makers. Here, do you remember the names of the clock makers? No, they were Connecticut clock makers. Uh, oh, okay, not not, not Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Okay, all right. Uh, the Atwater Kent you mentioned. Yes. Uh, the Atwater Kent became the Philadelphia History Museum. Just Philadelphia History, that's right. And Philadelphia History Museum closed. City closed it a couple of years ago. And um, you did mention the Pennsylvania Historical Society. Right. Now, what you may have mentioned that because something happened just in the last week. The uh, Pennsylvania Historical Society filed suit against the, uh, the city for shutting down the uh, Philadelphia History Museum and making a plan to turn over the collections to Drexel University, which is not going to operate a museum, but is going to operate a lending, but their plan is to operate a lending library with the, uh, have you been there? No. To the, to the uh, Philadelphia, no. Well, those of us who have appreciated the Philadelphia History Museum, I'm going to be talking to our board about whether we should uh, express some interest in the uh, Pennsylvania Historical Society's uh, uh, suit against the, uh, yeah. the city on that, on that matter. Um, we have, you're going to want to look at our surveying equipment. We have some surveying equipment in our museum. And you're going to want to see that stuff. Yes. Get you some pictures. Um, Benjamin Franklin, just to clarify the, the, the institution that ben, Benjamin, of which Benjamin Franklin was president. He's probably president for a bunch, but I think you were talking about the American Philosophical Society. Yeah. yeah. And, and is that where that yes. model is? Is the American still in the, the American? As far as I know, it is still APS. I, I'm going to want to look at that. Yeah. I actually had them take it out of the case uh, for me so we could make a model. We have a model that we made by taking the dimensions and what have you. So they were very nice. Uh, the funny part, and I think I mentioned this, the funny part, they told me that for a number of years, the model was, was uh, labeled Fulton. <laughs> Oh, oh, I was going to mention that. Um, as I understand it, uh, Fulton was an apprentice in a shop here in Philadelphia while Fitch was, was 
organized in 1785 while Fitch was, was, was here. Yeah. And uh, the piece that I just handed you this evening mentions that uh, apparently Fulton, uh, let us say, stole some ideas. Well, they, let's put it this way. He borrowed papers of Fitch when he went to France. Uh, we don't know why, but he left all of his papers in France. And Fulton was in France. Uh, and he got a hand. He got his hands on all of uh, Fitch's drawings. Well, that's a double coincidence because according to the piece that I just handed you, um, Fulton was actually in town in 1785 when Fitch was doing his first demonstration of how the, how the thing might work. That would be, uh, and, and, it, and then there's this later connection in France. Right? Wow, well, what an interesting thing. <laughs> uh, okay, we're gonna want to look at that. Now, uh, the piece that I just delivered tonight, one of the wonderful things we get to do. We have such a rich board. Um, one of my colleagues uh, came up with a book, which our guest, Mr. Fleischer, has not seen before. Uh, so we made him a copy of the four pages Thank you. On, on, on Fitch, and I'm so proud of my board. <laughs> we, we, my, our folks just do so well, uh, and uh, we really appreciate your being here tonight. Thank you very much. Being able to find you. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Having not been here before, we're going to want you to come back and take a tour. We want everybody who's out here beyond the Delaware and uh, Frankfurt Creek who hasn't been here yet uh, to keep us in mind because we will be uh, increasingly available for, uh, for tours when people want to come, come see our stuff. And there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff. So uh, that goes, of course, for us, too. Uh, and because I'm retired, and I think almost everybody here, uh, when you folks want to come up and see the museum in Craven Hall, all you got to do is yeah, give, now tell us, a call. Tell us what, what there is to be seen. Well, we have you know the museum for Fitch. We have a uh, one-tenth scale model of the 1790 steamboat that we actually operate, have a movie. Um, we have you know, some drawings and uh, specific things within the museum. It's not a, you know, nothing historic. Uh, now this is two museum. separate institutions, the Craven Hall? Yeah, well, yes, we're, we're two different uh, incorporated uh, entities, but the Fitch Museum sits on that Craven Hall property. Okay, but adjacent. Yes, yeah. on the property. Yeah. So, so we can do both at the same time. Yeah. I have uh, I have put up a list in the back of the room, and uh, anybody who wants to add themselves to the list remotely, um, uh, can go to our website and, and uh, make yourself known. And uh, when the time comes, when I when when everybody agrees that uh, perhaps it's safe to, to make a long trip, uh, we will. Uh, will make a trip by uh, those of us who are, who are interested. I know there's more than just me. Uh, so we, Happy to we're going to want to do that. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, anybody else have anything at this point? Or shall we? Oh, oh, we're going to do the election now. Question. Yes, sir. The Library Company of Philadelphia has some drawings and some records that Fitch made a machine a big hole, took a docker to clean out the docks from building up. Hmm. Do you have any information about the uh, any machine that he made in Philadelphia for uh, cleaning the docks? I don't, I don't know. Wait, hold on. I don't know if that could be heard uh, by the remote audience. Uh, question is uh, about a machine uh, that is apparently uh, on record at the library company. Philadelphia for cleaning up the docks, cleaning out the uh, docks and silt, cleaning out silt at silt, the docks. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm not aware of it. That would be very interesting to to uh, research further. Yes, I'll have to visit them again. What is over? Yeah, what a privilege.
appreciate if you do find any information that would be great. I believe the library company is where those those record books ended up. Um, it was That's where he gave them the, the, the piece I gave you tonight or says that, that uh, his record books went to the Ridgeway Library, which I guess was became part of the library company or somehow got merged. The only thing I've seen, and this is in the uh, Historical Society of Pennsylvania, does that still exist? Is that the one that closed? Yes, H no, HSP, the All Historical right. Society of Pennsylvania is a very, very environmental organization. They have a workbook of Fitch uh, where he kept notes of his customers and so forth. And I had a chance to go down there and go through that and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that prudent wouldn't be very meaningful, except I found out that the owner of Craven Hall actually did business with John Fitch, and there is a recording of, and I forget exactly what what he purchased from uh, Fitch, but, but we found we had a direct connection to, uh, to John Fitch, the merchant. Cool. Which was neat. Anybody else? All righty, we're gonna do an election uh, before we adjourn. Um, but I guess we've completed the program. Uh, Fred, if you'll let Bruce know that we're ready. Oh, here's Bruce. Bruce is here.